Um, let me just welcome everyone. I'm Erica Wright, Associate Director of the HEAL and Narrative Medicine Programs. Um, today's art and medicine event continues HEAL's program's mission to align the work of artists, patients, with the core medical school curriculum to foster enhanced understanding between patients and future healthcare professionals. Um, I'm pleased to introduce artist Dylan Mortimer, who will be in conversation with our artist in resident, Ted Meyer, and Dr. Mark Elbar, um, co director of USC's Transplant Institute. And there will be time for questions and discussion after, and we'll try to end a little bit earlier so you can head out and get your lunch. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I will introduce uh, Dylan. So we are twice lucky to have Dylan here because we, we had given Dylan a show during COVID, and it was online, so uh, nobody really saw it. So we're giving him a chance to actually put his work in the gallery that you saw downstairs. And he has also um, recently moved to town, so he is now a local. And he has had two lung transplants, not just one. He's been through this twice. Um, so some facts. There's about 41,000 transplants every year in the United States. So if you guys decide that that is what you want to get into, Unfortunately for the patients, there will always be patients for you to do transplants on. And as far as for Dylan, uh, about 2,000 annually. The, the record was 2017, and there were 2,400 of them. So lots and lots of people. And there's 100,000 people waiting on the waiting list. And Dylan can talk a little bit about what that's like to be on the waiting list. So this is Dylan's history, and I'm going to have him start and talk about uh, his history of having his transplants, and then we will get to the doctor. Okay, yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for, for having us. Um, I was born in 1979, was cystic, uh, diagnosed at three months with cystic fibrosis, uh, fought it off most of childhood, did okay. Um, was able to, you know, do college, do grad school in art. That's kind of all my training is in art. Uh, was able to be married, had two kids. Then my lung function and health just kind of started to, to plummet, and the discussion started around transplant. Um, and I was transplanted in 2017, um, uh, you know, felt af after recovery, felt the, the greatest I had ever felt in my life after about three months. Um, and uh, about a year and a half after that was, uh, uh, they found rejection and was listed again uh, and transplanted again in 2019, so um, in April. So this April will be four years uh, from that. So keep going. Or... Um, no, let me, let me yeah. switch over to Dr. Barr. Yeah. So uh, there's about 40,000 transplants a year. Is, is this stuff routine yet? I mean, because I remember when I was a kid, we had the first heart transplant. It was a big deal. And now I, I know several people in the room here who have had transplants. Um, would, you, would you consider this type of major operation almost routine, or is it still? Yeah, if it wasn't for the donor shortage, it would be even more common uh, for organs like heart transplant, lung, liver and kidney, it's absolutely routine. As you mentioned, some of the statistics, I mean, liver is over 10,000 transplants a year, kidney is about 20, 25,000 a year, lung and heart, just because there are less patients on the list, but also less donors available, they range in the two to 3,000, but it's absolutely routine. And, and the biggest problem, as you've seen with discussions about patients on dialysis, getting access to kidney, once you're on the waiting list, there's equal access. The system, which is run by the OPTN under uh, NOTA, which was the congressional bill that authorized transplant in the United States, that, that's pretty colorblind. But the problem is for patients who are lower socioeconomic groups, they may not get referred for transplant. That's where the access issue. But once you're actually on a waiting list, the system is very, very colorblind as to how people are getting organs. But yes, totally routine now. Okay. Just letting everybody get in here. Um, so before we get to your artwork, 
while you're on that waiting list, let's yeah. talk about the emotional roller coasters of, of this. So you, you had your first transplant and then it started to go bad. Right. And then you had to like go through the whole thing again and you have an amazing story of how you got your lungs. And then once he's done, maybe you could talk about the, when one of these goes bad, like with Dylan, where you've done a perfect operation and then you still get a few months out, you start getting rejection, your patient's in critical condition again. Yeah, uh, so the, to try to describe the transplant experience in general is, is quite a mix uh, of a range of emotion that's very both and, I feel. It's hard to describe. I mean, it's immense, immense sort of glory and joy, immense, immense pain, immense, immense uh, survivor's guilt. There's a, just quite a host of emotions happening uh, all at once. And so, uh, you know, in time leading up to... Um, to being listed, to being listed, to receiving a transplant, to feeling well post, if, if everything goes well, to uh, experiencing rejection, to being listed again, to be, I mean, it's just quite a roller coaster that my family and I have been on. And so, uh, <clears throat> so it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of collision of uh, gratitude, gratefulness. And I try to kind of convey this in the artwork that I do because it's really, I, I find it to be kind of beyond words, really, and so I try to convey visually uh, what it feels like, the collision of, of sort of like absolute trauma with absolute joy. Uh, and so, you know, as you'll see, as you see uh, down in the show, but also uh, in the images we'll show, um, I'm always thinking about like the both and of that. Like how, how, do, you, how do you experience uh, profound joy amidst profound suffering? So. Um, that, that would definitely be the theme, <laughs> so it would seem, of my life and my art. So, so let's talk about you, you do a perfect operation and you still don't get the results you want. Yeah, so uh, I assume the students in the audience have studied other organ systems. Lung, lung transplant, and it depends on the disease. Dylan's describing kind of what the roller coaster is for cystic fibrosis. That's one of the few diseases that we do transplant, lung transplants for, where the person's been born with a disease that they're basically dealing with for childhood, adolescence, and then adulthood. When I started in transplant over 25 years ago, we would be operating on cystic fibrosis patients at a much younger age. But the care, the pulmonary care, antibiotics, other drugs that have been coming out, including even new gene therapeutic strategies, have really revolutionized cystic fibrosis care such that many of the patients we operate on have their first operation in their 30s or even their 40s as opposed to teenagers, which is what we were seeing when I started out my career. And then in answer to Ted's question about you do, everything is perfect in the operating room, but things don't go well after. Lung transplant is a little different than all the other operations we do because that's the only organ you're transplanting, which is not only at risk for rejection, but at very high risk for infection, because you're breathing through your mouth and nose, and so you're exposed to the outside environment. And lung also can simultaneously reject and be infected, whereas most other organs, you're doing one or the other. If you're over-immunosuppressed from your immunosuppressive drugs, you get infected. And if you're under-immunosuppressed, you reject. You can have everything perfect in lung transplant still have rejection. You have enormous surface area between your airways and your blood vessels. So the, the lung just has this huge bed of tissue that is at risk for being attacked by your immune system. And you're breathing in all the viruses, bacteria, and fungi that are in the outside world. So that's, that's usually the, the cause for most patients ending up with the need for either second transplant or not doing well is because of rejection or infection. And then Dylan's probably familiar with where there's something called CLAD, which is chronic lung allograft dysfunction. These are long-term problems. This is why lung transplant patients very often have problems by five to 10 years because of the fact it's a low-grade form of rejection, which is, which is pretty aggressive and has a higher rate of incidence than in other transplants. So, so just for them, because a lot of them might have to deal with even if they don't get into transplants, they're going to have to deal with patients who they're, they're doing their best and they're still getting bad results. So before we get into Dylan's art, could you, 
you talk about that having to I mean you you have some sort of bond with these people you've done you've been inside their body you've done your best and they're still they're still having bad results and maybe it's not on you but in a way it's yeah no, I mean it's almost I'm sure everybody here in the audience is too young to remember but there was actually a period of time when USC, myself, my chairman, who was, who was really the pioneer for this, and I was just part of the team at that time when we were doing living donor lung transplant for cystic fibrosis. So we would take the left and right lower lobe from two different family members, mom or dad, brother or sister. And this was almost always in CF patients because they tended to be Dylan's tall, but a lot of CF patients don't grow as tall because they've been chronically ill. And so they're kind of the perfect patient size for using another adult's lower lobe. And we got to be extremely close. The CF, the CF patients and their families have bonds that are much, much stronger, in my experience over the years, than a lot of other patients that you'll be taking care of with other diseases because the parents and the siblings have been dealing with the, the patient's illness from the time they were basically kids. Um, you have to have, Dylan, Dylan's story doesn't have ever a happy ending if you don't have a family that's supportive. Um, we don't transplant patients, in fact, if they're isolated and by themselves. They have to have a stable home life. They have to have support systems. Um, and so, I mean, we got very attached over the years. I still stay in touch with some of the patients we've operated on over 25 years ago who were living donor or cadaveric lung recipients. Uh, in fact, Dylan, and it's a small world. Dylan's surgeon, he and I were talking when we went down to look at his art before this session started. And I, I, his, his surgeon is a close friend of mine. I've known him for, for two decades. And that was in Kansas City, right? No, New York was the second transplant, and, and St. Louis the first one. So, 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 yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's a small right. world, and, and I mean, all of us who, any of you who decide to pursue surgery, it's, it's always as... The cliche goes, it's an enormous privilege that people trust you to operate on them or their families do. And in the case of kids, it's the mom and dad that are putting their kids' mm -hmm. hands in your lives. And that's, that's something that all of us in surgery never, ever take for granted. It never gets old. Yeah. Oh. All right, so we're going to switch a little bit and talk about Dylan's art. So the next three images... Um, <clears throat> You use a lot of metaphors in your art. You don't actually, well, sometimes you do lungs, but you do a lot of objects to sort of show what you're going through. So yeah. I'm going to just click through the next couple of these. Yeah. Some of the work I'm going to show is downstairs, and if you haven't been able to see the glitter fest downstairs, yeah. uh, go downstairs. Go get some glitter on you. <laughs> and, there's, uh, and then I'm going to show a couple that aren't down there. So this one is downstairs. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of it was trying to uh, evoke the variety and range of emotions and thoughts happening through me. This, this was created right before the first transplant, really as kind of a declaration of what I wanted to see, which was a healthy bronchial tree. You know? So it was just asking myself that question, how do I imagine, how do I, how do I visualize uh, that which I desire so much, just to breathe and, and breathe well and breathe fully. So. Uh, thus, a lot of glitter you see is this sort of shiny, transformative medium. Um, glitter also uh, sort of has all these parallels to disease for me. I mean, people sort of hate it, but they love it. You know, they're bothered by it. It's dirty. It gets in the way. It, you can't get it out. Uh, but people sort of love, you know, obviously people don't love disease, but they love the stories of overcoming. They love the stories of triumph over such a you know, dark, deadly disease like cystic fibrosis. When I was born, average lifespan was about 14 to 17 years, uh, and, and now it's mid-50s, I think. It's just come such a long way. So, so, so anyway, the, the, the glitter, uh, speaking to that tension of sort of love-hate, you know, um, and trauma, joy, you know, it's, it's evocative of this sort of Baroque expression of glitter on top of glitter is, is me trying to transform a really, um, you know, really hard diagnosis to carry from birth uh, into be something that's, that's you know, hopeful and, and joyful. So yeah. this one I really love. I, I, so I look at this one and I just think of you thinking of uh, having motion, being able to move things you aren't able yeah. to do with bad lungs. Right, right. 
Yeah, so I mean, r really simply, the Air Jordan shoes here, um, you know, uh, it was only about seven, eight years ago that I started making artwork related to my health. I mean, before, not surprisingly, I didn't, you know, I didn't want pity, I didn't want it to be all about that, I didn't want the discussion only to be, but as I was being evaluated for transplant, it made sense to, you know, it felt almost dishonest to not bring it in in some way. So I started, I was making signage work at the time, kind of like Vegasy, marquee, sign, you know, large format signage. So I just kind of carried that into, uh, with this infusion of sort of biological imagery. But as I was searching for source imagery, uh, you know, around air and breathing, um, you know, specifically around air, these Air Jordans came up and it just sort of clicked in me, this shoe, that I had desired, you know, from uh, when I was little uh, to still to this day, uh, has air inside the shoe, you know, <laughs> and they're sort of shaped like lungs, and they they are they became for me this sort of symbol, as they are for everybody of either athletics or fashion, but also health and life and breathing, um, and and so I I often use uh, you know that specific sort of uh, Nike Air Jordan One as this symbol for uh, life and breath in addition to you know, all the other symbols it carries. And so here, this piece is downstairs, I just see as like a stack of air, you know, just stacking um, you know, air on top of air. And again, in this sort of expression of over the top, you know, like some images of bronchial trees, just adding extra branches onto the image as, as sort of a surreal, almost declaration of, of what I'm hoping for. Uh, here, a, a big old pile of air. So, Doctor, when you first, I, you know, as opposed to other operations where maybe you're alleviating some pain or hip replacement and somebody can just move better, there's got to be a point where Dylan comes out of recovery. What was your oxygenation transfer before your first? Uh, my, my oxygen was sort of okay, but my lung function was uh, down to 20%. Um, prior to transplant, the first time, then down to 10% prior to the... the um, okay, so someone's got 10%, and then you come in and they, they can take that first breath. And I was just wondering if you could sort of talk about the whole reaction of seeing somebody able to take that first good breath again, the family reaction, like they've got a future, they've got life, you've succeeded. Well, like, like Dylan was describing, that after the first transplant, that was the best he had felt. That's a very, very classic response, especially with patients who've grown up their whole lives with the need for pulmonary toileting from all the, the secretions and all the exacerbations and the antibiotic courses. And they can never really take a deep breath without it really being feeling like it's inhibited or coughing. Uh, it's not like someone who has IPF or other diseases where it's suddenly they're healthy one year and then they're sick, uh, you know, or COVID lung, which we saw a lot of in the past two years, but they were completely healthy before. This is somebody who's never completely felt normal with breathing or exercise tolerance. And we've had one of our patients years ago actually ran the LA Marathon two years after his lung transplant. And he was somebody who, you know, could barely do activities of daily living. So it's, it's, it is as described, it's, 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 the, it's such a complete sea change in the way they feel. And from our point of view, the recovery afterwards is obviously post-op pain. The incisions for cystic fibrosis patients is a clamshell incision, which is a big cut across the chest, both sides crossing midline. So there's pain <coughs> post-op. There is a lot of pulmonary rehab and physical therapy that get involved. But so what you see in terms of their initial function at the time of discharge it's gonna be even greater three months later or six months later as their FEV1 pulmonary function tests continue to improve. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's an amazing feeling when the patient had, takes that, those, those first big breaths off the ventilator and says, I could never take a deep breath like that. Mm -hmm. And they're not coughing up all this green glitter. So. Right. right, right. How was it for you, that first breath? Um, you know, it, yeah, I would just echo, um, you know, all those sentiments, I, I think, um, the, you know, the first breaths, I, I'm consumed by pain, you know, so, so there was that, but I think just noticing the, uh, not noticing the need to cough, you know, after about five minutes was, I had never known that, you know, for 37 years, and suddenly after uh, that, I, I just, I, I didn't need to cough, so, so very soon, it, you know, 
noticing I could move and my oxygen stayed up and those kind of things was, was just an incredible feeling. So, um, you know, my poor family, I'm wanting to cl climb every mountain and, and run everything, you know, and see every event. I mean, I, you know, so uh, thus forgive me all the explosive glitter. I mean, it's, it's a really joyful experience to go from, you know, not breathing to being able to breathe fully. Breathing is really awesome. I highly recommend it to everybody. It's just, it's an amazing experience. So. All right. I think we're. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is a series that I love because, and I'll have you talk about it because it's just something I never noticed until. Yeah. Uh, so why don't you talk about this and then I'll move yeah. to the next one too. Yeah. This is a, a series of backs of ambulance doors. And so uh, the title is uh, Gates in Proximity to Paradise, kind of a play off of, uh, you know, Gates of Paradise uh, idea. Uh, and, and yeah, then there's an, an image uh, um, looking out of the back of ambulance windows, which was an actual photograph I did take as I was being uh, rushed from Kansas City to St. Louis to be emergency listed for my first uh, lung transplant. So, you know, again, the, the reimagining the scenario, um, you know, I wasn't actually wearing Jordans at the time, but in my imagination, I was, you know. And uh, the, the image before the ambulance pieces, um, those are the kind of symbols that I, I really go after as an artist. Uh, um, you know, you never, ever want to see those doors um, until you really want to see those doors. And so uh, it, it, the movement from again, trauma to uh, joy, to euphoria, to, um, you know, hope, salvation, saving, death, life. It, they're just all sort of wrapped in there. And so seeing the beauty <coughs> in something as uh, really sort of volatile as, as ambulance doors um, a, a, or, or the lens through the back of ambulance doors is, is very much what I'm trying to convey the, the, that sort of both and of it. And then, and then again, yeah, here reimagining the landscape, um, you know, uh, these, this sort of like scar at the top, raining down healthy cells. Uh, again, this sort of like uh, vision of, of what I'm hoping to happen on this journey. Talk about using glitter because yeah. a lot of, you know, we've shown a lot of artists here over the last five years a lot of the work is pretty dark, although it all is sort of future facing. But you're, you're, it looks like Las Vegas downstairs yeah, with yeah, all this yeah, glitter. Yeah. It's right. not the kind right. of thing you would think would be talking about death. Right. Um, yeah, a again, very much the intention to, to transform uh, that, those experiences to be uh, this palette of really bold, bright, uh, and glistening colors. Um, you know, the, the trauma and the darkness and the, I consider it to be absolutely there. It's not an act of denial or trying to switch topics or anything. It's taking, again, the, the very, um, the, the elements and um, vernacular of, of, of death and, and lung transplant and disease and, and chronic and all these things and trying to, you know, how do I see them like these through the, the IV bags? Um, so on the left, it's, that's, you know, hanging IV bags. Um, this is actually paint, uh, no glitter for that one. But, um, uh, you know, how do you, you know, staring up at those things so, so often, those sort of often clear bags of just uh, liquid that you hope is going to, you know, transform what's happening inside of you. So how to revision that. And then on the right, the um, transforming visually the, the imagery of hanging IV bags into almost uh, balloons, you know, uh, switching symbols, switching metaphors almost to, to um, bring hope to a, a situation that there would seem to be no hope in. So Dr. Barr, I, uh, you know, I always talk to people about their profession and the unique things about their professions and a lot of professions, if someone has had a heart attack or cancer, it's something that came on later that people might not be prepared. You're with someone like Dylan. I know you do other types of uh, transplants too, but someone like Dylan, this is something he's he built toward his whole life, and you're sort of, in a way, the end result of his wishes coming up. So maybe you could talk about the difference, uh, and again, for the, the students of, having a patient and family that's coming to you as the end of a process as opposed to the start of a process? I mean, again, there is a whole variety of lung diseases that lead to transplant. 
the cystic fibrosis patients, like I mentioned before, have had lifelong disease. They've also got any, any cystic fibrosis patient who's being taken care of well is with a CF specialist. So uh, starting with pediatric CF and then going to adult. So they've got doctors, nurses, other allied health professionals that have been involved in their lives for years and years. And after the transplant, even though that's the big Hollywood lights, camera, action moment, you still, there's still so much work and all the aftercare in terms of the anti-rejection drugs and prophylactic antibiotics and just routine care, nutrition, which is a big issue for CF patients, that they, their journey is first starting. It's a new chapter that they've started with a transplant, but it's not, this, this doesn't end. This is a new beginning for yep. the patient. Um, some of the operations, not to minimize the amount of effort that a kidney patient has, They've gone from dialysis to getting their kidney, and it's pretty forgettable after a couple of years except for taking their anti-rejection drugs. The lung patients especially, to some degree heart and some degree liver, they still have ongoing monitoring needs that don't stop. Dylan and everybody who's had a lung transplant gets frequent bronchoscopy. They're getting pulmonary function testing all the time. USC actually pioneered a study a couple of years ago that we published, and this was prior to the pandemic, using a Bluetooth technology to monitor the patients from home. And this, this, again, predates the pandemic when telemedicine has now become so popular. But all of these things are involved in the aftercare of these patients. So it, it, it doesn't stop. You've, just, you've traded one disease for a chronic disease of immunosuppression. I don't know if that answers your question, but. It does. All right, Dylan, why don't you, here's a, so the, here's a few more glittery pieces. They're not as direct metaphors, but you can sort of talk about how they relate to your illness. Yeah, um, yeah, the, here clouds with this sort of explosive kind of glory light. Um, when these pieces are larger, it's like clouds, uh, light refracting against each other and, and uh, sometimes the shoes sort of kicking around rays of light. So. Um, th this sort of collision of, uh, again, the euphoria of feeling really well, but also juggling, uh, you know, everything just mentioned, and survivor's guilt, um, you know, the, the, um, it's a really humble uh, gift to receive, you know, someone's donated lungs. I mean, it's, it's inexplicable. Um, so I, I visually try to convey the, um, <clears throat> you know, the gravity of receiving that, and then um, sort of how that light bounces around, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, it, it's, it's sort of too much to contain. So thinking about, like, here, thinking about, like, a, uh, an apparition or, um, you know, in, in holy scriptures when the, the glory light is, like, uh, too much for anyone to handle, but you can't look away. You know, it, it feels very much like that. Like, there's that tension of, like, this is, it's overwhelming, but I, but I want more. <laughs> you know, I want to press into more of life. I want to, you know, uh, capture this, but it's 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 kind of beyond my ability to behold. Yeah, here's here's some of the the shoes kind of kicking uh, the the light around, you know. So uh, yeah, the fusion of those symbols. So uh, it's just kind of visually the way I, I work um, is is often the language of these symbols talking to each other. And uh, if you haven't been down there to see the show, this is all cut paper. Uh, so I draw these things, cut them out of paper, paint and glitter them and then collage them together. So, uh, so the, the end effect is this sort of layered collage of, of glitter on top of glitter on top of glitter. Um, again, in sort of a Baroque uh, celebration of both intensity, the trauma and the joy. Yeah, here's, here's again a bronchial tree. Um, the symbol of tree uh, is, is obviously very wide and vast in, in the forms of trees that we see much like the uh, bronchial tree, the different uh, individual lives that r we come across that have lung disease or, um, you know, their, their own unique story. So, so here, um, much like that first bronchial tree where I infuse a sort of stained glass coloring throughout, um, here's like an almost refracted kind of stained glass window, but it's, a, you know, it's an image of a tree. Uh, but I, I'm always thinking about the parallel of bronchial tree to a uh, tree we'd see in nature and, you know, all the, the parallels that those hold. Yeah, and then, yeah, this actually was made when we, I did a project with, uh, with Ted um, at his, his ranch um, just outside Joshua Tree uh, where we transformed, you know, I um, painted um, a dying 
tree, a dead or dying tree. I've done this a few times where the whole idea is like to revive a tree much like my bronchial tree was, was revived. So we painted in pink glit, uh, you know, glitter and, and sort of glistens. Uh, and actually the first time that I did that, I don't know if we have the images of the tree here, but that, that tree uh, did actually come back to life, um, you know, and sealing the, the moisture of the uh, tree kind of shot up, um, you know, moisture to the tips and green came back out. So I uh, joke like that was the intention really to bring trees back to life. But, uh, but it, it was a happy accident, but it did happen. So uh, again, all, all the sort of parallels of taking that which is dying and, and reviving it. So uh, here was just a form inspired from Joshua Tree right by uh, where his ranch is. And, you know, there's all these sort of uh, deformed kind of, um, you know, I don't know if they're yet to be fully grown uh, Joshua trees, but all these sort of single forms. I just like to, in general, to explore like the oddities of, of trees uh, that I come across, much like the oddity of my own bronchial uh, tree and, and the own sort of deformations I've had to, to navigate and, and juggle with. So I, uh, I'll do different manifestations of that in the collages that I do. Okay, so the next few, this one's downstairs. You are one of the few artists that we've ever had that actually depicts their doctors. And um, yeah. these to yeah. me look like amazing thank you yeah, yeah, notes yeah. to your doctors. So yeah. uh, why don't you Absolutely. talk, I'm gonna go through the next three slides and you can talk about them. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, this piece is just called Surgery Diptych. Um, which was made since we just moved to LA uh, this summer. And so, yeah, the, the, the palette changed, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, um, being influenced by kind of all the plant life and just life in general here. Uh, and so this sort of vision of like a surgery scene happening in the midst of this exotic jungle uh, was the inspiration of, of this piece. A again, um, the, much like the back of ambulance, much like IV poles or scars, any of the symbols that I use, um, you would hope that no one would ever, you know, need a surgery like this, but, uh, but yet this is the very thing that gave me life again, again and again. And so, uh, so it's again celebrating, it's a celebration mixed with mourning, mixed with hope. It's, there's a lot of things happening. This piece, uh, again, about five feet by four feet, uh, that now is in Barnes uh, Hospital where my first transplant was, and uh, it's called the Inevitable Healing. Um, I'm sort of, you know, there's a surgery scene. I'm, I'm laying on the, this imagined uh, operating table and there's sort of doctors around. Um, there's, there's kind of operating slash praying slash well-wishing. There's sort of all of that energy happening around. The doctor has to have halos that are much like the forms of the cellular forms that are kind of flowing in uh, and out of me. And so there's just sort of that kind of science and faith fluidity happening. Um, I'm wearing Air Jordans on the operating table, which they didn't actually let me do, but in my imagination, that's how it went down. So, you know, there I am with my Air Jordan 1s on as I'm being operated. And then, yeah, this was made after the second transplant, um, which is, it's called uh, The Ceiling Can't Hold Us. So um, it's really kind of, uh, this is eight feet by four feet, a remix of, uh, you know, the story uh, in Luke of the, of the man being lowered through the roof uh, for healing. And so... So here, uh, again, I'm being operated on, there's sort of this host of people. It's an homage, of course, to uh, doctors and, and medical workers, but just also the, the community of support. Um, in addition to your, your donor, right, it's, it's uh, receiving a, an organ transplant is um, this, this immense gift, obviously, but uh, that you could never repay. You know, I can never go around and, you know, give everyone my, my lungs again, and so, uh, nor could I go around and thank everyone that cared for me, that prayed for me, that, you know, well-wished, that thought about me. I mean, it's, it's this immense sort of gravity of, of receiving, uh, much like the emotion of, you know, this person in the story that would have to have his friends carry him to, to you know, uh, his healing and lower him through the roof to receive it. It's, it's such a humbling humbling gift that primarily is about what is received. I mean, I had my part and I exercised well. I did all the things that I could do, but, but the, the uh, you know, my salvation was beyond me, beyond my own effort. And so uh, the humility of receiving that um, and then living forward in that, in that sort of grace was, is very much what this piece is about. Um, slash also kind of a dance party, thus the ceiling can't hold me. <laughs> so, Dr. Rice, see you smiling while you're looking at these. What do you think yeah. of his depiction of your your chosen career? 
No, I was, I was thinking that Dylan putting halos around all of us doesn't minimize our God complex that we have in, in, in cardiac surgery. <laughs> we, no, we, just turn that volume we, up. <laughs> we have enough of that already. Uh, I, I think I think they're stunningly beautiful. I mean, I, I it's it's an interesting juxtaposition of an operating room with all of that other life around it. Right. I, the, yeah. It, it's they're they're absolutely beautiful and similar to what. You said, Ted, I, I haven't seen, I mean, I've seen art depictions of diseases, you know, especially more, you know, classic Renaissance type literature, but I've never seen something like this, you know, put in the modern operating room setting for a modern operation that the story's behind with what's almost, you know, a Baroque type of right, uh, right. You know, background. But there you go. No, yeah. I think it's lovely. Yeah. So this gets me to the last couple questions and uh, we're gonna go to the next piece. So uh, the congregation, now one of the things that, Dylan and I have known each other for a while, and we always have these talks because I am atheist and you are very spiritual. I look at all this work and think science, thank God for the advancements too. Yeah. of science, but you also are a strong yeah. believer, and I look at your situation, and I would be cursing God like I've had to go through this twice. Yeah. And um, Well, we've had our conversations, God and I, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about that a little bit, and then you had already talked about um, having a strong family and people around you after an operation helps recovery, but maybe you could talk about people if they have a spiritual belief or don't, or how that, that plays in on, on your side of it. So this piece, yeah, is called The Congregation. This is 52 feet by 10 feet high, um, cut aluminum, so from a digital file, really, that, that those trees are sort of mapped out um, in an Illustrator file and then cut and then layered over um, the, again, sort of stained glass motif, which is aluminum uh, painted and glittered. And you'll notice all the trees are dripping phlegm uh, with, again, the CF um, experience. So, uh, but here I'm thinking about the, the conjoining of trees, the community of support in the medical community, in the CF community, and the transplant community, um, the uh, togetherness being the thing sort of that holds us together. Um, so, and that piece now is at uh, Kansas University, um, installed permanently in the, on the university side of, the, um, of that campus. So, um, as far as, yeah, the, the faith, obviously, I mean, I hope that's, that's pretty obvious in, in the work coming through. Um, I feel that the, the sort of hopeful vibe of it um, is uh, a reflection about just, just faith in general. I don't, I don't have within me the capacity to, to have hope at some of these moments. And, you know, when I've, especially when I've gone through a lung transplant and I'm told um, that I'm going to need to do it again and that I'm screening out 71% of potential donors, and I'm told that I, there's no way that I would be transplanted at, at Columbia University. It's, uh, th there's no um, logical reason for hope in a moment like that. And so uh, what do you do? And so, so for, me, um, the, for me personally, the, the notions of faith and spirituality, prayer and all those, uh, in those moments become uh, more difficult because it's, you're going, okay, you know, uh, Lord, this is your humble servant. Uh, clearly, there's been a misunderstanding. I mean, it's, you know, what, what do you, you know, how do you even begin that conversation? So uh, for me, those moments were a lot. Of, I had an hour and 10 subway ride from Brooklyn to Columbia University where I, you know, I had no phone reception. I had nothing. It was just, uh, you know, kind of, I felt me and God just, just praying through the trauma of all this. Um, and so, you know, the variety of, uh, of ways, I, you know, and, and things that came out of those moments and those sort of uh, solitary times were, were very profound. And again, the community of, of faith and hope. Um, and I'd say just in general, people believing uh, and hoping for you when you can't, you don't have that in yourself, um, you know, it, it is so critical. And so um, it's, it has been interesting to, to see the reaction of uh, people in the art world, in the medical world, any, any context that I go to, to see um, uh, how, how impactful, um, uh, you know, that is to people. And there, there was a doctor in um, New York that said something along the lines of like, what we're doing is, is like healing the body, uh, which is obviously very critical, um, but what you're doing is uh, healing, you know, the, the metaphysical. And, uh, you know, what art does is, is sort of tap into that hope. And so, so for me, 
and I bet we'd agree about this for sure, that uh, when I was at my lowest, you know, 10% lung function, all these, you know, uh, being told there's no way I would be transplanted, I would still sort of crawl my way into the studio and create on the floor just as a way to kind of keep my spirit alive, you know, and, and to be able to kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, collage and, and render these images in, in spite of that, um, you know, these, these sort of dire, um, you know, uh, diagnoses that, that have come since birth for me has, has been a, a way to um, sift through all that, again, not deny any of them, hear that information, but, you know, uh, translate that and, and speak something else and sort of speak hope in, again, a seemingly hopeless situation. D did I work my way yeah. around that enough? Okay. That was good. Okay. <laughs> I'm just glad to know God is on the subway in Brooklyn. So. Yeah, amen. <laughs> so do you see this making it, do you see religious belief and these things uh, in your patients helping with their recovery? Does it not matter if they have a strong family bond? I wasn't planning on bringing up this kind of a story, but similar to a lot of doctors, you know, you tend to completely put your faith purely in the science of everything, and sometimes there are diseases like what Dylan has that are just overwhelming. And um, so for me on a personal level, um, I lost my wife last year, only in her 50s, from a very aggressive form of cancer. And because I knew scientifically that the prognosis was so bad, and I didn't have that religious construct that Dylan is lucky enough to have, I can tell you in the year since, especially with this happening at such a young age, that I'm so jealous of somebody who has that ability to believe because it does make a difference both pre-op in terms of willing yourself into survival as well as post-op when there's so many challenges and hurdles. And if you have a family like Dylan has who loves you deeply, just like I love my wife deeply, mm -hmm. um, you kind of have the attitude that you'd rather be anywhere with that person, even if that's nowhere, mm -hmm. than here without them kind of thing. And so the short answer to your question is I think it does make a difference. And if you had asked me that question two years ago, I would have said I'm not sure. But I saw enough people, and this was in the height of the pandemic, when uh, a loved one couldn't be with their their, their patient family member because of COVID, so they were isolated and they were sick and getting chemo or whatever disease they had by themselves or being treated for COVID itself, and they were dying alone. And I was able, at least because I had a white coat and, and uh, I'm one of the faculty, I was able to be with my wife, but most of the other patients were completely by themselves. And those that had a strong religious belief, I think, dealt with everything, even if there was no hope. They thought there was, and, and they, they had this ability to believe, okay, even if it doesn't work out, it's okay. And for those people who are not lucky enough to have that construct, and I include myself in that, it's pretty dismal when you have a disease that's right in your face that you're dealing with that, you know, and it would be easier in a sense if it was yourself than it is. I'm sure Dylan's mom and dad, or brothers and sisters, suffered in some ways more than Dylan did watching it all. And that certainly was the way that I was with my, with my wife. Um, so, yeah, I think it does make a big difference. Sorry about your wife. I'm yeah. sort of not sure how yeah. to just jump into the no, I, I, uh, uh, follow-up question. But thank you for I sharing. I wouldn't have brought it up other than the fact that I, the question you just asked, Dylan, I've given an enormous amount of thought to over the past two years, whether it's reading the Tibetan book of living and dying and all the other things that are spirituality, even if you don't have a specific construct in a, in, in, with a specific organized religion. And I think the people who do have that spirituality have a distinct advantage for, I mean, life, if you think life is fair, you guys just haven't lived long enough because inevitably it's not fair. And, you know, the old thing, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people all the time without rhyme or reason. So having some sort of a belief structure, I think really, really helps. Okay. Yeah, if I can jump in yeah. quick. I mean, just the, the, the degree, the, the um, posture that I've seen change around that in my lifetime, uh, from early on, I just felt there was a lot of, um, not scorn, but just a, you know, uh, almost disdain towards, towards that 
kind of belief. And, and increasingly, I find, um, I don't know, maybe as a society, we're becoming increasingly tolerant. But, but um, there, was a, there was a doctor that told me several years ago, I used to pass by rooms of, of people praying and, and think like, well, you know, that's, that's, that's good, you know, as an addition to everything we're doing. But we are really doing the important thing. And, and she said, now I, I pass by them and go like, I wonder if what they're doing is just as important as, as what we're doing. You know, I thought that was a really telling uh, sort of transformative um, thing around spirituality and hope. Um, do I have time to talk about the second uh, lung transplant? Yeah, yeah. we have, uh, uh, we've got just a couple minutes, so if you can do it quickly, because yeah, I have sure. his final question. Okay, okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I was given 71% uh, chance, or I'm screening out 71% of people that are matched to me. So, in other words, a really low percentage of finding any match. And Columbia says to me, there's no way that you'll be transplanted here. you got to get to Duke. That's your only chance. So, uh, because Duke, Duke, there's a variety of, Duke's a little more uh, CF-centric um, um, transplant center. And, and for a variety of reasons, they said that's, so I'm trying to get evaluated at Duke. You have to relocate a minimum of a year. So we're looking at houses. We're looking at schools for our kids, you know, all this. I get a call out of the blue from a woman who had been following me on Instagram and said, uh, you know, we've been following you. My, my cousin just passed away. The family's talk. We want to donate his lungs to you. And I say, um, I just get this call out of the blue. I go, that's really sweet of you. Thanks for thinking of me. Um, I'm so sorry about your loss. You know, uh, that's not how this works. Um, there's a list and there's a process and there's a, you know, and you can, you know, feel free to call the hospital and begin that. And uh, she says, okay, well, we're, we're gonna try. So I put this completely out of my mind. I don't tell my wife, I don't, t you know, cause there's just no chance, right? Um, a day later, my doctor calls and said, um, this woman called and has lungs for you. And I, I go, first of all, uh, you can do that. And she goes, I've never heard of it before, but apparently, yes, you can do deceased willed organ donations. And I go, secondly, it's a match to me. And she goes, well, it has two of the antibodies we we're trying to screen out, not the main ones, but it does have two. And so initially my wife and I go like, well, we can't do it then obviously. And she goes, well, we've talked to everybody here at Columbia and, and, and you know, consulted with everybody in St. Louis. We all concur, you should take these lungs. And I go, why? She goes, one, we don't know if you get another chance. And then two, she says, I love, she goes, essentially, this is a leap of faith. She goes, we have some research around tra retransplanted lungs, but not a lot. We have some ideas of what we think will work, but we really don't know. And so I go, wow, okay. Uh, so uh, I say, do I have some time to think about this? She goes, yeah, you got about half an hour. Yes. <laughs> As you know, the clock is ticking. So uh, I talk my wife, with my wife about it, and we just feel, okay, there's still several steps in the process. This is not meant to be, um, you know, it, it won't happen. But uh, they fly a doctor from New York. He looks at the lungs. They look good. They were in Kansas City. Uh, the lungs look good. He flies back with them, I'm told, to be uh, up at the hospital by 1 in the morning, and we'll know by 5 if it's a go. So I'm there. Uh, my friend drops me off. I'm there by myself in this dingy little room in Columbia University, and 4.45, I get a call, and they say, the lungs are here, they look good, we're taking you back right now. And within seven minutes, I was you know, out for seven hours of surgery. Um, I wake up, and, and I love it, all these uh, surgeons are coming around going, um, for real, how did this happen? <laughs> you know? So it's just a really fun uh, story to tell, um, again, of, of just kind of, no rational reason to hope, but you know, you just, you kind of, you, you keep going and you just don't know. Um, even social media could, could help save you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just that uh, for all the ills of, uh, you know, something like that, it's, um, you, you never know uh, where hope might be sourced in, so. All right, so my last question is always to the doctor. Can you explain to them how you chose this profession? What personality type you think is good for this profession? What? That, that's a, a long story, but I, I think as you guys have gone through school, you have mentors and role models. I mean, for me, it was my chairman of surgery. Um, I actually had planned when I was a medical student to go into high-risk obstetrics because those were the residents and fellows that I just thought were terrific, and it was who you were exposed to. And then when I was actually a resident, I got exposed to this one chairman who's one of the major names in the world in, in transplantation. I never thought about that. So in large part, he was, for those of you who know the old TV show, MASH, he was Hawkeye Pierce, the real Hawkeye in real life was based on this individual. Um, and um, 
I just was extremely fortunate that he took me under his wing. I worked with him in his lab and finished my clinical training. And in large part, it was because of that single individual. Um, and I think you should go, certainly in medical school and even in residency, if you ended up in general surgery or general medicine, you should go into each subdiscipline with the idea that this is what I'm going to do for a living because you'll enjoy the rotation more. And then you'll figure out which is fits with your personality. Um, and surgery, surgery was great, but I also liked being up in the chest. I didn't want to be near any stool containing organs down below. So it, being a nice, clean surgery and heart and lung surgery combined with the mentorship I had from this individual was how I ended up in it. But when I was a medical student, I had no clue. Um, I was just kind of drifting. And it just took one person who really was, I mean, that person was as influential, if not more, in my life than my parents or anybody else that I had ever met. So. All right, thank you. Do we have time for a question, or do we need to? But does anybody have a question? We have about three or four minutes here. It doesn't have to be a blood relative, and it's not just lung transplant. It's for all solid organ transplants, because transplants, again, not to use a cliche, it is truly a team sport afterwards. The number of clinic visits, the immunosuppressive drug regimen, all of, all of the testing they need afterwards. This is not like doing an appendectomy or a cabbage and you kiss the patient goodbye and you never see them again. These patients are getting frequent flyer miles coming back to medicine and surgery clinic. So if they don't have at least a close friend who can help out, somebody who's really dedicated. And so this, this is even on guidelines from UNOS and from all the professional societies, transplant societies, that an absolute contraindication to proceeding with transplant for somebody or even listing them is lack of social support. All of the patients and their family or friend, friend group are all interviewed by a social worker before we ever make a decision to list. In my case, I, I don't think MD doctors are the experts on this by any means. I rely on a social worker that I've worked with for 20 years. If he tells me, you don't have to worry, the, these people have this patient's back, I know it's okay, but if you've got somebody, whether it's substance abuse or they come from a broken home and they live literally by themselves and they have no one that they can go to, it's just not, it's a waste of an organ. If you had unlimited organs, you could say, okay, even if it's only 10% chance, it's going to work out. But if, if we give a lung or a heart to somebody who's not going to take care of it and that organ rejects and dies, the donor family expected more of that because they gave their loved ones organs with the assumption that that organ was going to be taken care of. So it's the right thing to do, not only for the patient, but from a societal point of view. And we are in a zero-sum game in transplant. That's one of the only aspects in all of medicine when you decide future careers where for every patient you transplant, someone else doesn't get transplanted. There's no other medical care or surgical procedure you do that if you take care of one person, someone doesn't get that. And that happens every day. So we're making those decisions all the time. But you do it with experts. And again, you have to have a really good social worker. Sometimes a psychiatrist is involved also. But I've, I've had the same social worker for over 20 years that's worked with me. Great. All right. I think we're out of time. Um, if you haven't seen the artwork yet, go downstairs. Uh, thank you.